Welcome to episode 16 of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Saturday 11th of October, very nearly Sunday the 12th. I'm Tony and with me this week are Alan. How are you doing, Alan? Hello, not bad. A bit late, tired, want to go to bed. But it's a very exciting show. And Laura's here as well. Hello, I'm here this week because Simon's on his way back from America as we speak, I think. Yeah, he's been another work jolly. And Dave's here. Hi, Tony. Hi, Dave. You're moving soon, aren't you? Yes, I am. It's going okay. I'm moving down to the sunny fields of Devon. Excellent. But you're still going to carry on here, aren't you? Uh, yes, yes, I am, yeah. I mean, it's me that carries the show. Okay, what's coming up in the show today? We've got news. We've got a discussion on remote support. A chat about the conflict between Ubuntu and Kubuntu. And we have a competition. We both set a new one and the winner from our previous one's announced. And we've got lots of listener feedback. Sounds like a fun-packed show. We've had an email from David Robertson who says, I've just taken a look at Planet Ubuntu and a chap called Jonathan Thomas is at the top of the list. He's written a blog post discussing how, as I understand it, he feels Kubuntu and KDEs are neglected and Ubuntu and GNOME receive the lion's share of the attention in the Ubuntu community. I'm not deeply involved in the community myself, so I wouldn't want to debate whether or not there is any neglection, but I thought this was a bit much. As far as I know, Canonical Ubuntu have chosen to use GNOME by default and then support KDE as a derivative distro out of the goodness of their own hearts on top of everything else. So I think it's a bit rich to complain that KDE isn't the sole focus of the minds of everyone at Canonical. Wonder if you guys have any thoughts on the matter and whether it'd be interesting to discuss on your wonderful, fantastic show. (laughs) <laughs> let's hope it is yeah well, thanks for the mail yeah first of all we're ending on a great note there but okay let's go back to what you <laughs> <he> actually said <laughs> Kubuntu and Ubuntu it's not always been an easy relationship has it well when you say relationship you're more talking about the GNOME community and the KDE community would you think I, I guess so I think because Ubuntu came along first and has the name Ubuntu and Kubuntu was given the same name with a K tacked on the front right from the start people in the KDE community felt like felt that it was a derivative of of the Ubuntu project in general, even if it technically wasn't. And they said, well, Ubuntu should have a G in front of it for the GNOME version. It should be Ubuntu, which then became something else. But So it's always had a little bit of a a difficult relationship right from the start, really. Well, if you go into Launchpad, Kubuntu comes under the Ubuntu project. If you you file a bug under Kubuntu, it's filed under launchpad.net slash Ubuntu. Now, I mean, I think we should also say that none of us are heavy Kubuntu or KDE users actually recording it so we might be coming from a slightly biased angle but the way i see it what ubuntu did is when they first formed basically picked the cream of the crop and bundled it together so what canonical did is they picked the what they thought was the cream of the crop and obviously they thought that gnome had uh, a better standing uh, so they bundled all the best together and said this is our product and then they've also said well hang on we will also support these other ones and the, there are derivatives and I don't have a problem with that. Now, the the main basis of this argument... Yeah, you don't have a problem with it. You're not a KDE user. Well, this is true, but that's that's by choice. Now, the thing is, if I was a big KDE user, why, you know, I don't necessarily have to use Ubuntu, but, I mean, it is more community-supported. Yeah, but hang on, hang on, hang on. Originally, there was the Ubuntu project and the Ubuntu distro. And this is... I think this is where some of this confusion comes in, is there's Canonical, who are the sponsors, Ubuntu, which is a project, and then Ubuntu, which is the product of that project, which is the distribution. And it happens to come with GNOME and a bunch of GNOME apps and not KDE. And initially, there were no other uh, derivative distros. It was Ubuntu as a project with one product, and that was it. And then, you know, some people obviously wanted... KDE. So then the Kubuntu project was started as a as a derivative and it's now been absorbed as, you know, an, an official distro. And you know what that's like because you you're part of the Myth Buntu project and that's an officially supported um project to a certain degree. Um only community supported. Yeah, I'm, I'm when I I that's why I said to a certain degree, yeah, because there's there's levels of support. Zubuntu, the XFCE doesn't get the same support. Some of the different um, chipsets don't get the same kind of support. PowerPC doesn't get the same kind of support. I, I think the way you could probably gauge it is basically how many paid employees are actually working on each derivative. As far as I know, with KDE, Kubuntu, there's only one. And at the time of Jono's blog post where he responded, there was only two GNOME guys. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's not like okay, it's double the number of people work on GNOME in a, in in the within Canonical. But it is like that, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay, double. But there's a significant difference between one hundred and two hundred, and less, <laughs> much greater difference than there is between one and mm. two. 
There's also only one more guy working on it. <laughs> or the developer, sorry. Now, I mean, one, one other thing I should probably mention is there is in the development version of Ubuntu, there was a recent breakage. Now, this isn't released for general consumption. Uh, so, I mean, you would expect breakages. Uh, one of the things that broke was actually Bluetooth. Uh, it didn't work properly in the development version. And that's what triggered this blog post that this question is all about. I mean, with this recent blog post, they talked about there was a progression where it stopped working, yeah, um, in the development version. Of KDE, of Kubuntu. Oh, of Kubuntu, yes. Um, now, I mean, this isn't released for general consumption. This is, you know, for basic people just to test. You know, you wouldn't be using this on your own computer unless you're, you're a daredevil. You, you can expect bugs. Yeah, you can expect bugs. You can expect now, bugs that might trash your network card, for example. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th- that one's completely yeah, I mean, there's, there's only so far you can push the this is a development version. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, if you're, if you're working with embedded equipment and you, you, you blow something out then and you're using something which isn't actually said this is safe. Right? Well, okay. So, the, I mean, we're deviating away from the fact that this was a Bluetooth breakage that was seen to be caused by a GNOME developer, but it affected the KDE yeah, part of, yeah, the, of the project because um, they were actually updating the Bluetooth uh, framework so basically they both use the same libraries if you like in the background but they both have different user interfaces Right. Um, but it's using the same undercode now with this one they actually upgraded to the next release quite late in the cycle because there was some other there was a lot of patches to apply so they thought well they would just bump up to the next version that, that, that's pretty much summarising it but with, but with, with this one the developer actually pushed this change and he put call to test out on the Kubuntu developers list. And he, he didn't get any response. So he's actually said, you know, this hasn't been tested on Kubuntu at all. Please test it. And he didn't get any response. So what were you meant to expect? Okay, but that same thing happened for the SSL vulnerability almost. You know, but developers miss things sometimes. But it's quite interesting to me that this is a product of the whole way the Ubuntu project is set up because we have one set of repositories, because there's one universe repository that has got all the Kubuntu bits in and all the Ubuntu bits in and all of the Zubuntu bits in it. And the masters of the universe can make changes to those packages. One person can uh, change a particular package that has a knock-on effect in all those different uh, derivative versions. And there's, as far as I can tell, no real process for ensuring that that doesn't happen and ensuring that all the different developers and testers for each of those derivative versions sort of signs off on those packages to say, look, this is fine in Zubuntu, it's fine in Kubuntu. I suspect that's a resourcing issue more than anything else. Sure, but it also you know, then, is, then becomes a stability issue or a functionality issue if it doesn't get caught. And it clearly causes friction between the developers on those projects. But this would cause friction between them, you know, however many derivative distros there were. And, you know, if it was, for example, something that broke TV cards, the Mythbuntu guys would be pretty annoyed about it. And if it was something that broke um, support for low power CPUs or low spec CPUs, the Zubuntu guys might be pretty annoyed. So, you know, this is going to happen because there isn't a massive testing team that are testing every single. Well, there is a testing team. But mm. There isn't a massive testing team that can test every possible scenario. Mm. And that's why we rely on the community to do these things. But it kind of gives the lie to the approach that Kubuntu and Ubuntu are separate projects, which is one of the things that Kurt, Kurt von Winkelmann, as we call him from Canonical Support, he said in a, in a reply blog posting that Ubuntu and Kubuntu are separate projects. Why should one care what the other one gets up to? They're like two any two random open source projects that, that don't necessarily have anything to do with each other. But that's not the case. They are working from the same repositories. They're working from a large number of shared libraries and shared source yeah, There's code. a significant shared code base there that you know, one could have a knock-on effect on the other. So there should be a level of integration, I'd have thought. There, there was something Kurt mentioned in there. He said, oh, with this particular person who's flagged up this, uh, this, this particular issue we're talking about, um, he said, well, he hasn't subscribed to the bug. He hasn't done this. That, to me, is the mentality of saying, don't complain, show us the patch. And I, I don't think it should work like that. I mean, that, that, that's how I took that. Yeah, I think I think in in some parts Kurt was somewhat harsh. Um, is there like an automated regression testing for um, down sort of downstream derivatives? There are there is a testing team, uh, and Dave Murphy and uh, Dave Morley and people like that are part of that team of people who test the images. And but I mean, I guess there's only so far you can test it if, with the limited resources they've got. Yeah, but if the the developer who made the change were able to just hit something. And it just quickly tests 
I don't know how it would. I don't know how quite how the development's set up. But, but if, if he's not ultimate, if he's not a KDE user, I guess he can't do it himself with his infrastructure. But as Dave said, he asked. He put out a call. What was it on the Kubuntu Devil list? Yeah. Or something? Well, there was an initial problem for some reason. <laughs> The Kubuntu developer mailing list uh, basically had a rule that basically anyone from an at Kubuntu email address or or email at Ubuntu could post directly to the list without subscribing. Yeah, But it turns out they actually had the rule misaligned. So anything at Ubuntu didn't necessarily work. So his message was actually held up in the queue. <laughs> so I don't think he can really be blamed for that. I think that's bad. That's an unfortunate, <laughs> uh, unfortunate thing. I think... Perhaps people are getting their knickers in a twist a little bit too much about that specific issue, but it does highlight the 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 clash between GNOME and KDE, Ubuntu and Kubuntu within the Ubuntu project. Yeah, I mean, one of the things about Ubuntu, though, is it's because it's got such a big community, things do get tested quicker. Now, I mean, it's unfortunate that the, the KDE users of Ubuntu, uh, the community is not as big. If the community gets bigger, then then th- these problems will help I be actually, reduced. I actually don't have any clue how big the KDE community is. I mean, I know in this room, we all use GNOME. So we all use Ubuntu. That's four of us. And it's 100%. Yeah, absolutely. 100% so everyone uses world. GNOME. Nobody uses KDE ever at all. No, in the whole not world. What I'm not, <laughs> not what I'm saying. But no, most people that I speak to do use GNOME. So, you know, from a... From an anecdotal point of view, you know, just finger in the air, checking people I know, you know, most of them use GNOME. But is that because your social circles are formed around GNOME users? <laughs> yeah, I don't like, you know, communicating. This is the first the question person, he asks when he meets somebody new. Well, the, yes. a good thing to do would be at the next Ubuntu release party, say, you know, who here is a Kubuntu user? Let's get some stickers made up with gnomes on them and KDE <laughs> logos cogs on them and just slap them on people so we can instantly see if they're a KDE or a, a, a gnome user and then segregate the room so that I'm not talking about segregation but just getting a, a straw poll of, of how many people are using Kubuntu compared with how many people are using Ubuntu uh, uh, for people who are actually active in the community you know might be likely to turn up to a, a, an Ubuntu or Kubuntu based event for example yeah I mean it, it shouldn't be uh, a segregated community precisely for the reasons we were talking about and that there does need to be a level of integration and sort of testing um, so it's a shame if people do kind of have this mentality that they're over there and we're over here I think Is it more that this this problem is in the community and people jump on any opportunity to highlight it? Is that more what it is? I mean is it actually not there in real life and technically these problems come up very rarely but when they do come up, they're jumped on and people say, look, here's the difference between Ubuntu and Kubuntu. And obviously it's going to be the KDE people who are going to jump on it because they're the, you know. And it's seen as more evidence of this yeah. lack of support. Yeah, absolutely. It's the underdog thing again, really, isn't it? Well, Linux was the underdog for ages and people would, well, it still is in, in generally. But, you know, Linux was see, perceived as an underdog. People would champion it. Um, and now Ubuntu is getting quite a lot of mainstream press, or certainly a lot of IT-based press, and it is the poster child, and there's the blue-headed stepchild in the corner um, who now want their share of the press. And Red Hat went through the same thing. So it's inevitable. When when Ubuntu becomes 50% every desktop, and Kubuntu is, I don't know... 30%, then Zubuntu will kick off. Yeah, then Zubuntu kicks off, then the open box people kick off, then the Flux Ubuntu people kick off, and, you know, is this just part of having communities that that are separated by their allegiance. Yeah, maybe. What are your thoughts? Let us know. Podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. Last episode we asked, what does wine stand for? And the answer, of course, is wine is not an emulator, not wine is not a Windows emulator, because that would be WinWi. <laughs> <laughs> and that was what somebody put, was it? <laughs> yeah. Um, and we also accepted um, that it doesn't stand for anything at all. Yes. Which is apparently actually the technically correct answer. Really? As pointed out by at least one of our listeners. Yes. Since 1993, the Wine Project has rebranded itself to does the... It, that, does that mm-hmm. nerd voice work well for you, Tony? It, it works. No, that's actually his normal, that's my normal voice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he puts <laughs> on his own radio voice. This is my radio, radio voice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, so we actually accepted both of those answers. So the popularly correct one and the technically correct one although when we set the question did we actually know that it wasn't no 
We'll we generally don't know the answer to any of the questions we set until we set them and then think, hey, yeah, majority. We, should, <laughs> we, we should probably look this up somewhere. On the other hand, we probably don't um, give the prize just for a really verbose answer. So just the answer is good. Although I do like to read some extra stuff in the Yeah, answers. it's nice to get feedback, yeah. even, even if it's within a competition mail. Because yeah, we do read them all. It's not like auto-sorted. Yeah. Laura reads them all. <laughs> <laughs> Producer Laura. <laughs> yeah, th- there was one guy who um, wrote about sa- saying how wine is not an emulator. It's a recursive acronym, acronym similar to GNU's not Unix. This is in reference to the fact that unlike traditional emulators, for instance, That's those enough now. Have, That's stop enough me now. when you're bored. I'm bored already. It doesn't emulate Game Boys, PlayStations and Amigas. It has to, only has to emulate the Windows API, Can not the processor turn off architecture. Tony's mic- <laughs> <laughs> There's about three times as much of that. But, you know, thanks for emailing in, Rob. He does say, I find you together with the Linux outlaws fill the hole left by Rugwe- <laughs> Wug Radio. <laughs> Wug Radio. <laughs> Windows users group. <laughs> Lug Radio. Very well. So thanks, oh, that's Rob. good. Excellent. So that, we'll forgive the, the yeah. verb, verbiosity. Is that a word? Verbosity. 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 We do like no. nice comments and funny comments especially. Yeah. Mike in New Zealand said that he didn't want to win the whole voucher. He just wanted a hat. I don't Any know. Any particular hat? I'm assuming not a red hat. Matt Lee's hat? <laughs> Matt Lee's hat. Matt Lee's Matt badly Lee. drawn hat. <laughs> Jason Licorice uh, asks if he wins, can he have Davy's babies and will Poppy sing him to sleep for a week? I think there's some medical anomaly there if he's going to be able to have Dave's babies. Also, if somebody's been in a room with Popey, I know that it's impossible for him to sing you to sleep because you then wake up 10 minutes later when he starts to snore. And the winner is Martin Meredith. Congratulations, Martin. So we're going to have a new question this week. And Laura, you've got a new question for us, haven't you? Yeah. If you go to the Canonical store, uh, shop.canonical.com, how many of our competition vouchers, which are £20... Yeah, 20, mm-hmm. 20 British pounds. British pounds. Um, how many of those vouchers would you need to buy the IBM DB2 Express C 9.5 for Ubuntu 710 from the Canonical store? Alternatively, it's probably the most expensive product on the website, so just look for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bearing in mind you can buy a pen for 68p. Okay, so send your answers to competition at ubuntu-uk.org and the closing date will be the 22nd of October. Oliver Gravert, formerly of LTSP fame, now working on the Ubuntu mobile team, has announced the availability of the new Ubuntu mobile images. Currently in beta, the images are designed to be used on netbook and mobile internet device classes of machines. That sounds very cool. Can we just sort of stick them in a standard PC as well? I, I suspect you can probably stick them in any kind of PC. Yeah, they're just USB images. So you download the image, chuck it on a USB key, and so long as the PC will boot off a USB stick, then you're laughing. At Ubuntu it. in your pocket? Is that Ubuntu in your pocket, or are you just free to see me? Soren Hansen from the Ubuntu server team has announced a new version of the Ubuntu VM Builder tool. The tool, which has been recently rewritten in Python, simplifies the process of creating virtual machines under and for Ubuntu. In the rewrite, the tool was renamed from Ubuntu-VM-Builder to encourage its use outside the Ubuntu project. You could use it to build a Fedora virtual machine, or you could use it to build a you know, Debian virtual machine. And what sort of virtualization engines does it support? It's got a plug-in system. I'm not, I'm not sure which ones are supported. I think you can use KVM, QEMU. We'll link to um, Soren's blog post about it where you can find out more. <laughs> Pre-release versions of the latest Linux kernel have been trashing Intel network cards, rendering lots of laptops useless plastic lumps. The proprietary NVIDIA driver is suspected of causing the kernel to misbehave and corrupt the firmware on these cards. Is it really pushing it a bit far to say they're turning them into (laughs) useless plastic lumps? Well, people have had to send their laptops back because the network cards failed on them. Yeah, that doesn't make the entire laptop broken. I mean, mine was mine was disabled while it was while they were fixing it, and I still use my laptop. It doesn't make it broken, but it's no use to you if it's in the post on its way back to Dell. You you could travel with it in the post, of course. At the Linux Plumbers Conference, Intel showcased their effort at making the EPC boot in five seconds. They did it by streamlining the kernel, removing or replacing demons and services with lighter weight ones, which were more appropriate to the masses. They also do some customizations that would directly focus the hardware they were using. For a full description, see the Linux Weekly News at lwn.net. 
Five seconds is a bit quick, isn't it? Quite nice. Yeah, then you slow it down. That's way too fast. Yeah, we won't get to hear Pete Savage's bongo drums. Yeah, but also, booting time is time for me to come put the kettle on. You know, it's <laughs> <laughs> but shouldn't we all be using suspend and not, not booting? Yeah, when that works. Online repository of the Inane and Trivial, Wikipedia, have announced that they're ditching their 400 assorted Red Hat and Fedora servers for Ubuntu server, saying that it would cost more money to move entirely to Red Hat. Citation needed? <laughs> You're funny. <laughs> actually, I mean, this is a really good thing, isn't it? You know, people moving over to Ubuntu. Case Cook actually uh, published a blog post the other day, which actually made me think. And he was saying, you know, he actually makes him sad. I thought, why does this make him sad? He was saying, well, we shouldn't be focusing on trying to switch people from one free software to another free software. It would be really good and big news if a company was switching from non-free software to Ubuntu. That'd be great. Yeah, but it's really good to see a large deployment of Ubuntu server. Red Hat's got an established user base and is well known in that field. Obviously, this is big news for Ubuntu, but is it big news for the free software community? No, not really. But this is an Ubuntu podcast. Oh, well, it, I think it. I think it is to some degree that they can say, "Hey, look, we can provide this massive resource of information, and we're using a set of software from one vendor, and the vendor happens to be Ubuntu." Also, that there's another organi- another Linux distribution competing with Red Hat. Now it's all about choice. <laughs> Desktop virtualization software of choice, Sun's VirtualBox, has reached version 2. The new version includes support for 8.10 of Ubuntu as a guest and host OS. So do any of you actually use VirtualBox? Yeah. Yeah, I do, yeah. Yeah, I was quite happy to get it working on my laptop on Intrepid. The Ubuntu Free Culture Showcase winners have been announced, and that's for the media content on the Ubuntu CD. Andre Vidal had the best audio entry, and Andrew Higginson had his video entry chosen. So congratulations, chaps. How many people entered? There were two video entries, and there were about a dozen different people who put audio entries in. It's a real shame that there wasn't more. I guess part of the problem was the fact there wasn't really that long a time. Yeah, I think they'll give it a longer window next time around, and Jono said on his blog post they want to do it for the next release as well. But it's good to see, you know, creative people using uh, Ubuntu for, for, for great content. And I think the video thing in particular is very visually impressive, particularly given that video editing on Ubuntu can be difficult. Did uh, Nelson Mandela uh, submit an entry this time? No, he didn't. MSI confirmed this week that the return rate for their Linux-based networks is four times that of the Windows version. The news was confirmed by the Canonical Marketing Manager, Jerry Carr, and seems to indicate that perhaps our faith in netbooks to spark the Linux revolution may be misplaced. Have we got any idea why people are returning them? Well, it seemed from the articles that I read that people didn't like the idea of learning something new. They, they expected to buy a netbook and be able to use it straight away. They expected it to have the Windows XP interface, basically. I, I don't know that much detail about their expectations, but I expect so, yeah. Well, uh, one thing that would interest me is would people return them if they were Vista when Vista was first released? Because that's a whole new interface. Would people return a netbook if it ran OS X? Yeah. Instead of Windows. If you were so, expecting Windows, probably. So if you didn't like Ubuntu and you're not listening to our podcast, please contact us for the reasons you returned your netbook. Are they being missold the um, laptop as just being a cheap laptop that people expect to be cheap for some reason other than that the operating system is different? If they're expecting either explicitly or implicitly Windows and then they return it when they discover it isn't, Surely it suggests that they didn't understand clearly before they bought it what they were getting. And for something that's that low cost, do you think anyone's going to spend a huge, invest a huge amount of time in selling the operating system to a customer? Or is it just, here's a laptop and nobody really cares what's on it until they get it home? I would like to know why they felt they couldn't get on with it. I, I did hear reports from uh, who was someone who was in the retailer who was stocking these and they overheard them saying, oh, you know, we are doing this offer, but... We've only got Linux ones left, so you don't want one of them. Uh, you have to wait for the XP ones to come in. I've also heard someone say, that you don't want the Linux one, it's rubbish, get the XP one. So yes, there may well be some mis-selling going on. In but in the, wrong, <laughs> yeah, in the wrong direction. In both our, directions. In our, yeah. <laughs> one thing, as um, Ubuntu is more heavily used, especially by our friends and family. I think there's there's a need for us to help them because we, you know, as users of Ubuntu have been using it for longer, we probably know a bit more about it than, than our friends and family, and so we need to help them. One of the problems I have is that most of my family live geographically remote from me, so I need some kind of remote support. 
And I wondered how you guys remotely support. I've got a few options online, but I wondered how you guys support remote people. Well, I don't do remote support at the moment, although my dad was uh, visiting earlier in the week and was talking about so this Ubuntu thing, what's, what's it all about? I think he'd had a, a nasty experience with his Windows PC um, and lost access to a few files and was interested in, in whether Ubuntu could help him out that way. Um, so I was really pleased uh, that he was interested about it. And then he said, yeah, and I've got these two CDs and one's live and one's, inst- one's installed to the computer. And I thought, that sounds like a rather old version you've got there, Dad. Um, but... I would be interested in that sort of support product as well, because if he does get as far as you know, installing it to his hard drive, then chances are he's going to need some support at some time. And I'll be quite happy to offer him that support. But in terms of my own usage, I have used things like uh, VNC and stuff to administer servers and things remotely, Windows servers that have the VNC <laughs> installed, um, and uh, occasional SUSE server, which has X running on it. Oh, I mean, my, my most common one is... Um, uh, VNC over SSH. I mean, that's my most common. But the trouble is with that is you need to mess about with the firewall to open the port to allow the connection in. Yeah. So what what do you do? You like SSH to the remote the remote end, and in that SSH session, you tunnel a VNC port so you can then VNC to the machine nope. on the other end. Easier than that. You literally just do on the console VNC viewer, the IP address. Uh, sorry, local host, um, and then minus via. And have I got that right? <laughs> this is why we don't break. This is why we don't break. Yeah. What do you do in terms? What what do you what do you do in terms of the process? Yeah, I mean, I literally type VNC viewer, and basically, I say how I want to do it, and I say I'll do it over the SSH tunnel. So you have to have SSH in. I have to be able to. I mean, but things I make it so I can SSH to start with for other reasons. So this is like a desktop, is it? Yeah, for your so your mum, dad, yeah, well, family, yeah. friends, yeah. whoever. Okay, but, but as you say, that requires setting up firewalling rules. Yeah. Surely what you really want is a big button on the desktop that goes, uh, I need help. Ho- Tony, help me now. Click. Yeah. Um, presumably they've got, they've got me on their phone and said, oh, this is broken, can you have a look at it for me that's, first? That's exactly the kind of thing I'm looking for, is, is something where if you know someone phones me up and says, I'm sat in front of the PC, it's broken in some way, I can't do this, or you know, can you help me? I want to press a button and I want it to show me their desktop or them share their desktop so I can see it. I know, you know, we're 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 Linux E experts and we can SSH in and remotely from the command line execute stuff. But sometimes you need to be able to see what's on someone's desktop mm. and not just see the problem, but also show them the solution. Yeah. I mean that's where the X eleven VNC program does come in handy because the it, thing that the remote desktop that's built into yeah, Ubuntu. You usually uh, VNC starts another instance of the desktop running, which can actually cause quite a lot of problems if you're running two instances of GNOME, say, as the same user. But X11 VNC will show you the current running X session, which I've used for, say, adminning servers and things, but would also be useful for seeing a desktop. The downside of that is that VNC is pretty slow unless you get all the compression settings just right. Now, the first people that wrapped this up quite nicely were the GNOME machine people, weren't they? That was a really... But the only problem is... Was that NX or something? Yeah, yeah. yeah. NX machine. Yeah, I mean, they, they did quite a nice job. But again, you still need to have the, the firewall stuff started. Well, I'll tell you the ones that I've found online and one that I've tried. There's one called Gitso, uh, G-I-T-S-O. Uh, we'll put a link in the show notes, but you can get it from um, a Google code page. And it's written uh, in such a way that it supports Windows, Mac, and Linux. And there's a nice little package. You can just click it and install it. And actually, all it does is wrap up ssh and vnc in a nice little package and it works really really nicely when you install someone's pc for them you put gitso on their machine and they don't have to configure it or do anything and then you have vnc viewer or gitso at your end and if they phone you up and say they want support you tell them to open gitso which they should be able to find on their their applications menu or whatever and then they specify a connection to you and they don't need to open any ports on their firewall so they don't need to do any monkeying around at their end Mm. but you need to have a port open at your end now if you're willing to support a number of people then you're going to be able to open a port on your firewall i would think um and they connect through your firewall and you then see their desktop that just sounds so 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 rather than listening for the connection it actually pushes out and says hey you know i want support rather rather than having to yeah, yeah so. I think it does reverse SSH tunneling. I love reverse SSH tunneling. And I do too, but in, I can never get it right on the command line. So having a nice, friendly GUI for someone else to do that 
So that's like a brilliant idea. Yeah, and if you're the family geek, you're fine setting up a firewall port and opening all that up and, and having yeah. it open on the internet and knowing how to secure it. Plus, the other really funky thing is because it's cross-platform, because it uses open source software like SSH, like VNC, the VNC server and the viewer, it's all cross-platform. It means that wherever I am, if I happen to be uh, somewhere where there's a Windows machine, I can easily get hold of Gitso, the Windows version, and remotely control someone else's machine, so long as the firewall's set up to let me do it. Is it properly free, as in Big F free? It's GPL v3. Oh, excellent. And is it packaged? Uh, yeah. There is a deb on the site, so yep, you just click the deb, and it will install, and it installs very nicely and easily. There's a, a .dmg if you're on a Mac, and there's a, an executable installer for Windows users. Now, I, I actually used this in Anger just a couple of weeks ago, and uh, and you know the person there wasn't uh, a computer expert, but he wasn't. You know, he 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 knew his way around the computer. He managed to install it without any difficulty. Um, the thing that surprised me is. Suddenly, without warning, I suddenly got his desktop on my screen. It didn't say, do you actually want to support this person? It just appeared on my screen. I thought, wow, <laughs> that's, that's pretty and good. It, but obviously, from a security point of view, they have to initiate the oh, process. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not like they'll get random people connecting. Well, that does raise an interesting point, though, because have you got to set security stuff up on your end, as in the family geek end? Well, you, you, he, he happened to be running Gitso yeah. when he told the other person to run Gitso. You, yeah. you, you, you can open it with one or two options. You can open it and say, I want to support someone. I want to be supported. Mm. And I already had it running in the I'm willing to give up support mode. Okay, so anybody who connects to your, your open port can have their desktop appear. Yeah. 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 But That's I mean, a whole new well, form. if he's got Gitso run. Yeah, if you've got Gitso running. A whole new form of messenger spam. <laughs> I see. But, I mean, what I'd really like to see is something like this bundled in with something like Pigeon. Because, I mean, I know that Windows already does this, don't they? What, the remote desktop? Yeah, it's very loosely integrated with Instant Messenger on Windows, isn't it's, it? Yeah. It's better than what we've got. This is true. This is true. Is, uh, go on. I was, no. uh, was going to say, the other advantage of, of that model, the Gitso model, is that if you have a dynamic IP address, if you're on an NTL connection or something like that, you haven't got to do the whole is what is my IP address.com uh, or what, get them to do that yeah or, or, to, or yeah. the dynamic dns or setting up anything yeah. like that as well, long as exactly, you're on a fixed ip address presumably that's what i had to do with my brother's computer and it got to the point where i was doing stupid things like when his machine booted up i did a w get of a random file on my web server and if i ever needed to know his ip address i look at the logs on my web server and i can find it out mm. but that's like messy and clunky and if you were as the family geek on a dynamic ip address you could probably set up the dy- the dyn dns the dynamic dns stuff yeah. and they just need to go to pope yeah, you... dynds.com or whatever that's it is that's pretty much exactly what they do yeah they right. just have to fill in the host name that i give them Hmm. I mean, this isn't, it's not perfect. It's still, you know, um, but it's from, good enough. From when I looked at it, there was, I'm sure there was support to actually be able to provide an installer to someone where it already had the server information in there. So they literally had to open it up and press, go for it. Nice. Well, now, I guess if you if you were the person who installed it for them, well, I mean, it's open source software, of Yeah, course. but you could, you, you what could, I mean is, okay, if someone says they've got a problem, you can just email them an executable to say, install this, or sounds a bit dodgy, I know, but you can just say, install this. Or point them to a web, your website or yeah, something where yeah. you can... Yeah, and say install this. This will help me give you support, which but, which I know a commercial product go to my PC have done for a while. Because it's based on VNC, is it still quite sluggish over the network? It was usable for me. I mean, they they had quite a saturated ADSL connection, and it worked fine for me. Mm. I've not used it really in anger between two remote locations. I've used it between two machines that were on the same network through different routes, but on the same network, mm. and it was pretty quick. But yeah, I mean, it's based on VNC, so. Whatever limitations there are in VNC, it, it has that. But I would much rather do that than have to get in a car and drive somewhere and <laughs> and locally yeah. support someone. Um, there are other options as well. There's um, there's one called Yugu, which is Y U U G U U. Yeah, nice name. And um, they had a Windows version, and they've just started beta testing a Linux version of their tool. And it's kind of more towards the um, net meeting or or go to meeting that kind of product. So it's more uh, desktop sharing, application sharing. Okay. Um, so if you wanted to have a conference with multiple people in, mm. it's got like a little messenger window where you see all the people who are in the conference. But there's no reason why you can't use it for remote support. Now, it's it's written in Java. And like I say, they've recently ported it to Linux. And so there is a, a Linux version. And they are making some effort to you know make it see, I mean, available to us. By definition, being Java should be cross-platform anyway. When they're having to port it, I mean, I don't know. Well, what are they doing? Well, it's not, is it? Because the window manager is different on Windows than it is on Linux. So 
I, I can see how there would be some level of porting required. What is it they say? Java, write once, debug everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it's worth mentioning that if you have got friends and family who are still running Windows and need to support them, that you can use the terminal service client or our desktop on the command line to access those Windows machines remotely using yeah, the... Yeah, but you'd need, you'd need to poke holes in firewalls and stuff. You do, yeah, but it, it's not an option. It's not a case you have to have a Windows box hanging around just to support your Windows using friends and family. Right, sure. Um, the network things do get in the way, but it's not there's, impossible. There's another proprietary one that, I, that I've recently seen, which is called Crossloop. Um, I think you can get it from crossloop.com, and that's Windows only, unfortunately. But I did install it on a Windows virtual machine that I had, and it's very similar to Gitso. It has two options, provide support or get support. All right. But I think it goes through an intermediate server to negotiate the, the firewall rule problem. So you, you don't have to open a port at either end. So at least with Gitso, the person giving the support has to open a port in some way, but with Crossloop. But unfortunately, Crossloop is Windows only. Well, there's, there's one other one that I've come across, particularly from my sort of educational field, which is called italc. So it's italc.sourceforge.net. And it can do the remote support thing, but it can also do um, screen casting, if you like, effectively live screen casting. So they can see your desktop as well, which would be great for a little online tuition session. How do I do this? Okay, well, let me show you my desktop and I'll show you how I do it. Does it do audio as well, or would you have to have a phone call or something? I don't think it does audio, but it does messaging and things like that. So it's designed for a classroom where you might have 20 uh, people sat at a PC. You can, send them all, you can show them all your desktop and that sort of thing. Um, but it can do the remote support as well, so you can take over their mouse and keyboard. That's one thing I didn't mention about the Yugu one, actually. One of the, the, their selling points is that they set up, for every conference, they set up a conference call that you dial into. So if you didn't want to phone someone direct, you all call into this conference call. But I think they, they charge... That's where they make their money. Ah, oh, right, okay. So that's uh, Italc, the one you were talking about. Is that GPL? Yeah, it's GPL, which is great. Um, I haven't heard a huge amount about it. I haven't heard a lot of people who are using it in anger, but it seems quite a sophisticated project. And obviously there's Windows versions and Linux versions. Oh, right. So it's not a case you have to have a classroom full of Linux PCs for it to work on. You can use it on Windows as well. Cool. So surprisingly, I mean, that sounds quite mature. And I've, I've never heard of that. So I'll have to check that out. Well, I'm looking at the website and the icons look distinctly KDE-ish. So I wonder if that's why you haven't heard of it. Well, on Linux, it does need QT4. Ah, so it's KDE. Yeah. That's, so why, that's why I've never heard of it either. <laughs> so we've got at least three options there. Are there any other options you could think of other than, you know, manually the hardcore way, SSH and... No, I was thinking the hardcore way is to um, SSH in, do screenshots, SCP them back to you. <laughs> Surely the, the extra hardcore way is KVM over IP. No, the extra... KVM hard... over IP has always worked well for me. Surely the extra hardcore way is in a console, SSH and then doing VNC using the AA library. Okay, converting right. the, your desktop into ASCII art. The extra, extra, extra hardcore way is a really, really long VGA cable. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the feedback we got from the last episode. Thomas Mashos says a large problem with most bug reports is that they don't give enough of the type of information the developer needs to actually fix the bug. If another user in the five-a-day program knows this, they can query the bug reporter to get this information and thus save time in the bug fixing process. And they may also be able to confirm the bug themselves. That's the sort of triaging process yeah, that we were talking about, wasn't it? And that's, part, that's one of the things that's really easy to do in a five-a-day. You know, you just ask for more information. And Soren Salagi, also a developer, agrees with this and says that if this five-a-day thing's done in the right way and it encourages people to help with stuff like this, then it's a great thing. Although it's daunting at first, don't forget that even the smallest contribution can mean a big thing if, if lots of people do it. So do you just find five bugs a day and go, can you give me more information on this, please? If you want to be unsuccessful at doing that, <laughs> yes. Let's yes. not but start all that again. But you would be very <laughs> successful with five a day. <laughs> So Ian Pascoe emailed about how some people aren't keen on reading shed loads of documentation to get started on the five-a-day process. He suggests providing something like an interactive webcast that gives a tour and a familiarisation of Launchpad and then a foundation in the bug triaging process. And he did note that after the podcast, the UK was in the top five of the five-a-day in this week's Ubuntu News. Oh, that's good. So, what yeah, I saying? don't think we can attribute we can <laughs> we can claim credit for that at all. Oh, I was going to. So. Also, in his email, Thomas agrees that the five a day program is not good to use as a factor in the decision for UDS sponsorship. Um, not everybody that fixes bugs is going to report them to five a day, and it takes away time from looking at other bugs. He suggests that couldn't they just pull out how many bugs each person has worked on in a day from Launchpad? That would make it better to use. At the moment, it's kind of a hassle to report your five a day 
um, work into the five a day program. Um, oh, we should point out it wasn't the, the only sort of criteria for attending UDS. Yeah, I think I, I mean it was only in Jono's blog post where he mentioned it's a criteria, mm. and you can actually uh, report your five a day work with. There's a little applet that you can you know use to report your five a day. But yeah, I agree. I mean, it would be better if Launchpad could suck that information out of your profile in some way. That'd be good. Andy Stanford Clark, a loyal follower of the show, was disappointed with the five day part of the last episode because it was too long and too heated about something that very few of us are passionate about, as Popey clearly seems to be. So, although the content was of interest to part of our audience, maybe keeping it shorter would have been kinder to the parts of the audience who aren't that interested. You see, I kind of thought this was the problem, really. Not that many people are interested in five a day. So we're talking to people who aren't interested in something about something they're not interested in? Well, I'd like to know why they're not interested in it. Why are they not interested in checking five bugs or helping confirm five bugs a day? It did, shortly after release, spawn quite a lot of discussion about the actual five a day. And people pick sides and there was actually discussion. Which I think in many ways, that's what we were trying to do. Yeah, and that's a good thing. And... It did spawn a whole blog post from Jono. He considers the five-a-day program a success, um, more successful than Davy possibly suggested that it was. Um, and he does agree that five-a-day is not for everyone. Uh, he did, I think he says something about it does go up and down quite a lot um, in activity. So we might have been looking at those stats on a duff week. Yeah. We got an email from Ashley Rolf at Viglin, who's the guy we uh, negotiated the Viglin deal with. And he says they've had a fair bit of interest from our listeners on the MPC special offer that we announced way back in episode 11. He said they plan to stop it at the end of October, but the boss said we may as well extend it for the rest of the year. I thought Ashley was the boss. We'll now throw in a one gig USB memory key with each unit as well. As before, the offer is only available to our podcast listeners, and the normal price is £99 plus VAT. So if you want to get one at the discounted price of £79, including VAT and a keyboard and a mouse and the one gig USB stick, listen to episode 11 for all those details. And Thomas Mashos, good old Thomas, says in this huge long email of his um, that he'd also like to inquire about what seems to be a love fest for the Drobo. Um, not only from this show, apparently he hears about it a lot on the Linux Action Show. I don't know, I don't listen to that. Um, <laughs> for what I know, from what he knows of this product, it seems like the worst kind of product there is. Proprietary hardware. Sure, the Drobo is handy at backing stuff up and ease of use, but what happens if the Drobo unit fails, not the hard drives inside? From my understanding, drives inside the Drobo unit cannot be read in other devices. Your only way of retrieving your data is to go out and buy another Drobo unit, the very product that just failed you. In exactly the same way that a hard drive in a server that hangs off of a RAID controller fails, you need another RAID controller, the very device that just failed you. It's no different. Soren said, congratulations on the great show. I ended up listening to you guys while I was looking for a new way to get my Ubuntu fix. The Ubuntu OS and Fresh Ubuntu podcast haven't released anything lately, so I was left with the Ubuntu UK podcast. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> the barrel has been well and truly scraped, clearly. <laughs> well, he, well he, does, he does say, uh, I'm pretty glad about that. Um, I like the British accent better anyway. Jolly good. <laughs> yeah, top hole. Floyd Patterson says we need to adjust the mic levels and speak more slowly. Does he? I can't think why he needs to say that. Sorry, we need to speak slower? Yes, yeah. we need to speak more slowly. Dave, do you need to put the microphone because of your mouth? Luke Platypus says that even though I don't listen to this at home and near the kids, I do enjoy the fact of it not having swearing. I did used to listen to Lug Radio and enjoyed it, but at times it was a little too much. Yeah, and somebody calling themselves Wintellect uh, agrees. Basically, he's glad to hear that we'll continue to exclude profanity. He listens to the podcast at work as it's safe to do so. He also agrees with the comment that was made that the profanity isn't the only way to add emphasis to a statement. I think that was, that was my you. comment. So, yeah, <laughs> I agree. Alistair McKinley uh, commented on what a jackalope is. Uh, in the last episode, we spoke about it, uh, but he actually gave us some information about from Wikipedia to inform us that this is also called an antelabbit. Aunt Benny, Wyoming thistled hare, or stag bunny, in folklore is said to be a cross between a jackrabbit and an antelope, hence the name. Goat or deer, and is usually portrayed as a rabbit with antlers. Not a hollowed out rabbit, as you thought, Toby. <laughs> oh, <laughs> hollowed out pumpkin. I'm just looking forward to the next release of Ubuntu when we get round to start the alphabet again and maybe we can have Angsty Aunt Benny as the uh, code name. Can you eat a jackalope? They're non-existent creatures. <laughs> One of our researchers decided to do some further investigation regarding the backup from the previous um, episode. So, so Laura, do, do you want to um, go over that? 
We have a researcher. We have a researcher. We also have a producer. Wow. A tea lady. Yeah, after the episode, I was slightly guilty of the fact that I haven't actually backed up my system in a long time. Um, so I went off to find out what is available in Synaptic to back up because there isn't in anything installed uh, with Ubuntu by default. So I found a couple of packages that seemed fairly lightweight and sounded simple to use. First of all, there is the Pi Backup Package, which when you install it comes up in System Administration <coughs> File Backup Manager. The first panel explains what will happen and that you just have to press the big friendly go button, which is quite nice. You can be a bit more specific about what you backup if you want, but it's fairly well set up by default. Um, it doesn't do scheduled backups, but if you want to back up your entire home directory once in a while to a USB hard disk or a DVD or a remote location, say, this looks a pretty good one. The other one was Simple Backup, and when you install that, it comes up as System Administration, Simple Backup Config, and Simple Backup Restore. And it's a project that was produced by the Google Summer of Code. I actually tried this one out properly, and it's pretty good. It's a nice interface with some useful default settings, um, but you can make some reasonably detailed changes to the settings by um, configuring includes and excludes. Um, again, it backs up to local media or to a remote server location. Um, some usability things that could do with cleaning up things like it's not that obvious that the backup process has actually started. It tells you the process ID and that's about it. Um, and it's not clear that it's actually running um, other than going to look at the backup location and seeing the files increasing. It's not obvious either that it will run again if you shut down your machine. And actually it does. I hadn't realised that throughout the week and it was only this afternoon when I was preparing for this and I checked and it has put a backup pretty much every day that I've booted the machine. Excellent. So it is really good but it'd be nice if it was just a bit more obvious what it was doing. Um, so if these things could be tidied up and made part of the default Ubuntu installation I think it'd be a really good bit of software. Since the backup section we did last week I have visited my local Linux user group meeting and uh, one of the guys there gave a talk about a product called R Snapshot. And uh, I thought I'd give it a go. And actually, it works out really, really well. So I've switched from what I was using previously, which was Backup Manager. And now I'm using our snapshot to do lovely backups, which is what you told me to do, Dave. Well, Thanks. you wouldn't listen to me, would you? <laughs> well, you didn't give me a detailed tutorial but you, and you've presentation. Got, you've <laughs> got to love the syntax and the config file, haven't you? You've got space. What's that all about? I just don't care. Adam commented on our website that he's used and is very happy with Amazon S3 and Jungle Disk. And he gives a good list of pros and cons, which you can see if you look at the comments on our website for episode 15. And Jason Licorice also suggests Jungle Disk, as well as Spider Oak, which is spideroak.com, and Dropbox, which Alan talked about in the episode. Great. Thanks for all the feedback, yeah. everyone. And if you're working on something, you know, if, you're, if you're working on a groovy project, um, get in touch with us. We would love to hear about it. Podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. <laughs> Well, thanks for listening. If you'd like to get a hold of us, you can email the show via podcast at ubuntu-uk.org or leave 30 seconds of voicemail on 0845-508-1986. You can follow us on Identica via identity.ca slash UUPC or via our Twitter feed, which is twitter.com slash UUPC. Alternatively, if you're into IRC, you can chat to us via the hash ubuntu-uk channel on the Freenode IRC network. We welcome your suggestions, material, tips, reviews, rants, feedback, anything at all, both positive and negative. Please get in touch. Thanks also to our network of mirrors who make it possible for us to bring the show to you, shemu.com, bitfolk.com, and our other community mirrors. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.